Our next guest is someone who thinks a lot about the future in his role as the head of new products and solutions at Google. He's actually been there since 2005, so he's had a lot of time to see things that we once thought were science fiction become our everyday reality. He's here to speak to us today about failure, about creativity, and to dare us all to be a bit more audacious. Please welcome our keynote speaker, Jens Redmer. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a clicker? Sorry? I need a clicker. Do we have the um, clicker for the slideshow, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Jens. I've been with Google for 12 years. Um, so I have actually seen a lot of stuff uh, up and down the road of development and the road of creativity and innovation. Life sucks. Life sucks sometimes. You all know that. You have a great idea that you just can't sell to your boss. You may be in a challenged relationship. You may see family members get sick. So you, have, you see challenges all the time. So life sucks only sometimes. And it's important to address those moments when life sucks in a creative and innovative way. And what, I'm, like, what I'd like to talk today about is how do you find that secret sauce? How do you find that? salt in your soup of life to make life and work life uh, a little easier and a little more creative. So the first story that I'd like to share with you, and I'm over 40 now, so I'm supposed to give advice to people that are younger than 40. I'm actually closer to, I'm, I'm actually closer to 50, but that sounds a little sexier to say 40. Um, the first thought is, I suggest that you be a little more expansive when you think about creating ideas and creating products. What I mean by that is when you develop ideas in a typical setting, let's imagine that you're about to create a new product. You may be the CEO of an airline company. And you sit together with all your folks and say, we need new price models. We need new business models. We need new ideas to make our airline more successful. So what do you typically do? You sit together in a room. And then the first person will raise the first idea and say, I have the idea to do x, y, z. It's probably not going to take long before the first person says, ah, that's not going to work because we're such a regulated industry. Your idea is fantastic, but it's not going to work. Next person will raise the next idea. And the same, the same mechanism will be, will be happening over and over again. People will answer these ideas with no buts. And what I suggest here is to answer these ideas, as crazy as they may be, with yes and. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you are in that setting you are in this meeting, and you want to brainstorm on new ideas. And someone comes up with a crazy idea of putting the seats of a plane outside on the wings of the airplane. Obviously, a crazy idea. And typically, it's going to take 2.5 seconds before, before the first person says it's not going to work. And of course, it's not going to work, right? You're going to, see, uh, you're going to say, well, it's illegal. It's very cold, minus 50 degree. You're going to suffocate. There's no oxygen. Uh, it's very dangerous. You're going to die. Uh, and by the way, uh, it's against all airline regulations. So that would happen if you would, were thinking restrictively. If you think expansively, here's one thought. What would be great if you had the wings, the chairs, of this, uh, the, uh, the seats of an airplane on the outside of the wings? Well, you have fresh air, right? It's nice, fresh air. You can smoke, probably. You know, good news for smokers. Uh, you can stretch your legs. There's lots of leg room. Uh, your kids may be able to play. And look at the view. Look at the view. My God, you know, that's better than a window seat. So through building this idea, this obviously crazy idea, and finding things that are actually great about this idea, you can turn some audacious idea, some crazy, some crazy thought, into something, into sub-ideas that could actually bring you to things that you never have thought about in the first place. So in this example, maybe finding Segments in the plane that would, uh, that would be optimized for families would be an idea. Maybe additional legroom would be an idea. Maybe uh, you know, compartments for smokers, reinventing some uh, smoking compartments on the plane would be an idea. Some of these things you may not have come up with in the first place if you had killed the idea from the very beginning. So at Google, we always tell our product managers to say, well, have a, have a healthy disregard for the impossible. So think really big, because if you think big, if your aim is really, really high, 
you may come up with a lot of sub-ideas in building these crazy ideas that you would not have found otherwise. So if you want to build an elevator to the moon, go ahead, build that idea. You may find additional cool things that you wouldn't have thought of in the first place. The second thing, and there's a lot of talk about failure, so I'm not going to repeat all of the great fa things of failure. We think that failing is an is a essential and fundamental part of building a company. If you look at this guy, Sir Richard Branson, you would obviously say this is a successful businessman. This guy is so successful that he's even called Sir Richard Branson. But this is the man that brought you Virgin Cola. Anybody know Virgin Cola? 1994 is one. 1994, he introduced Virgin Cola. The bottles of Virgin Cola were greatly inspired by the body curves of Pamela Anderson. Miserable failure. Nobody to even today knows about Virgin Cola. Virgin also invented uh, Virgin Student, which was kind of a Facebook clone. Way too early, it got eaten up by MySpace. MySpace got eaten up by Facebook. Um, so this guy is a serial failure. He failed many, many more times than he succeeded, but still he's considered very successful. And that's because he took a lot of input to new ideas from his failures. He didn't see failure as a, as a stop of the route to success. He sees failure as a, as a catalyst to success. So sequential serial failure is the route to success. It doesn't end the route to success. So we need to praise those people that fail. If you look in the US and you talk to many, uh, many serial entrepreneurs and to many successful startups, they will tell you, I had to fail three ideas. I had to run three startups into the ground be before I actually had the, the great idea to found my, fo my fourth startup. In Europe, many times, failure equals stigmatism. And many people just stop because they fail for the first time. So they need to move on. Uh, and, may and maybe an idea could be to start educating students, to start educating pupils in early elementary school with the early ideas of building a company or building a business. If you look into the US or Israel uh, on a warm, sunny afternoon on the weekend in a rural area, chances are that you will see neighbor kids at the age of six, seven, or eight selling lemonade at self-built at self lemonade stands. And you know, one mother would cook the lemonade, and then many kids would sell the same lemonade. And your son may be, may be completely upset because he's selling the same lemonade than his buddy from next door. But somehow, his buddy next door is able to sell twice as much because he has better se selling skills, better marketing skills, or whatever. So they learn early, at an early stage, on how it is to build a company, you know, the lemonade sell company. And they also learn very quickly what it means to fail and how you deal with that. So we need to praise our, our failures, and we need to celebrate these as, as the new heroes. At Google, we actually have what we call confession sessions. So sometimes people get up on stage, and they share their great ideas, and they share uh, their great successes on what the products they build and how successful they are. But I think there's even more value in getting on stage and say, well, I failed in this product. I failed in this, in this thinking. I failed in this idea. And here's what I learned from it. And here's what I think you can take away from this. So it needs to be built much more into, into everyday's life. Um, at Google, we also are in, in, the, in the nice situation of being able to try out a number of, uh, a number of cool things. When we think about business models, we don't think the usual way. This is how a usual company would think of a product and the business model attached to a product. So you make assumptions on your price, on your product. You, uh, you make some assumptions on how long people will stick to your product, on the additional services that they may buy. And then you create a nice Excel spreadsheet uh, with a hockey stick model. So you lose some money in year one. You lose more money in year three. You lose even more money in year four. And then hopefully and eventually, the curve of your profits will go up into the right, the typical hockey stick model. At Google, we think this way. We think about toothbrushes when thinking about business models. So what we want to do is to create products that are so sticky, that are so sexy, that people want to use them multiple times a day. 
hopefully just like your toothbrush. This is why our product managers call it the toothbrush test. Is your product, is your idea so sticky that people will want to come back multiple times a day to use it? So there's many great examples also outside of Google for companies that did exactly that. Photo companies, communication companies, you know, all kinds of services where people are attached to getting a great service, getting a great entertainment, or getting some great communication so that they can use these products uh, multiple times a day. And then you can worry about revenue models after you have created an audience of millions, after you have created a lot of reach for these products. Let me give you a real life example of how you tackle things in, in a different way, in a lateral thinking way. Let's imagine for a second that you're not challenged with a business question. Let's imagine that you're challenged with a private question. Let's say that your partner goes to the doctor and is diagnosed with a th threatening disease, let's say cancer. Let's imagine that your family dad and your partner get sick. That's a challenging situation, right? It will obviously change your life. It's a challenge to your everyday interaction with your wife, obviously, with the kids. How do you deal as that, as that dad with that situation? How do you tell the kids that your wife may have to undergo chemotherapy and that she may lose her hair? Imagine yourself that for a second that you're that dad. How do you deal with that situation? What is the standard way of dealing with that? 24 months ago, that dad was me. My wife was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer two years ago. And just like many cancer patients, my wife wasn't really looking forward to dealing with losing her hair. So we thought about how do we deal with this? How do we tell the kids? And we found a solution by saying, why do we involve them in this process? You know, like many, like many cancer patients, she really didn't want to lose her hair through chem chemotherapy. So she, she decided the first day, the first hair will fall out, I will shave my head. And we decided to involve the kids. So rather than being a victim of something that happens from the outside, we created a scenario with yes ands, and we created a, uh, a model where we all sat in the shower, we gave the kids each an electric shaver, and we had a blast in the afternoon because the kids were allowed to shave off all the hair from mommy. They had a great time, it was a wonderful, uh, it was a wonderful event. And it was just like a party, you know, the kids really look back to that day today. Today everything is great, my wife is in fantastic shape, the, the kids have developed into the best possible monkeys that you can imagine. And th the interesting thing about this happening was that the kids were in control. They were not, and that was the, the, the different lateral thinking movement about this, this entire challenge that we faced in a private world. So you may, you may think, so what? What does this all mean and what do I take home? Um, I'd like to close with three, three thoughts on, on killers of development, killers of innovation. What keeps people, what keeps companies from being innovative and from embracing the opportunities that digital will bring? The first is ignoring disruption, right? So that's, that's an obvious one. If you think about gas stations 50 years ago, they looked a little bit like this, and they had one business model, selling gas. You may have the chance to find uh, somebody that can check your spark plugs or clean your car, but that was their only business model. 50 years on, the business model for gas stations has substantially, fundamentally, dramatically changed. And you could see that as a threat to your traditional business model, selling gas, but you can also see it as an opportunity because all of a sudden you have additional business models like selling newspapers, selling snacks, selling drinks that have a higher margin than your original business model. So if, I'm an, if, if I was the owner of a, of a gas station chain, I would see this as an opportunity. There are many examples, and uh, you're gonna see Christoph Käse from Springer Verlag on Thursday. He's gonna talk about uh, his view of the world from looking into the Silicon Valley. Um, Christoph Käse works for this man. This is uh, Matthias Döpfner, CEO of Axel Springer. I had the pleasure of working for Springer 
in the mid-90s, when, uh, when the internet was just on the rise. Back then, uh, Mr. Duffner was working for another company, and Springer hadn't seen uh, the opportunities of digital. So obviously, the, the, business chain, the, the business change and the dramatic transformation of the classic and traditional business of print, uh, print journalism has, um, has driven a lot of the developments for the publishing industry. It's obviously very difficult for a publishing company to gen generate money through print advertising and print journalism. Uh, but they have really grabbed the opportunities now. They really have wake, woken up. And now Springer is making more revenue, more profit in digital they have, because they have invested in their kind of gas station model. They have created the supermarket of companies for their core business model. So now they're prosperous. They really have addressed this, and they really have, have gotten their act together. The second is... The, re the reluctance of change. That's kind of a, the big brother of uh, ignoring disruption. A surprising and alarming amount of companies today, even today, still think that digital will not affect their business. Digital is everywhere, and there's probably not going to be any company that is not digital anymore. Everybody will become digital. Every company is digital. We're going we're to hear more of that over the next days. And the third, and my... And my favorite is procrastination. I'm actually a master in procrastination. So let me give you another, um, another personal anecdote. In my last year at university, my professor came to me, you still owe me that paper, Jens. You still owe me that paper. You've been owing that paper to me for the last four months. So I'm going to give you the last three months. I really want you to submit that paper. So I said, OK. I'm going to create a plan. I have three months. I have a deadline. Um, and I just chunk up the work that I need to do in the next three months in three nice and digestible pieces, right? So I have a nice plan. I, I felt really good because I had a plan, and I went back to play. Next morning, I woke up, and I thought, hmm, I know myself. Let me adapt that plan. So I know that I'm going to do less in the first month. So let's create a step model, right? So it's going to be a nice walk up the, that little staircase. Um, and I'm going to divide those three months into something that looks like this. And I feel really comfortable. I go back to play. Four weeks pass. Then I look at this. And it was nice. It was summer. I played, played some more. And all of a sudden, I look at this. And then the little panicky deadline freak on the top right looks at me and says, you really need to get your act together. I still don't get the message. So seven days before the deadline, I find myself here, and I finish the paper in seven days, and my professor comes to me and says, Jens, we have to talk about your paper. I said, well, here, here it is. Yes, I've read it. It is the best paper I've ever seen, and I had to talk to my colleagues. That didn't happen. <laughs> no, I just, I just couldn't resist uh, to tell you the story. Um, what's important in life is... There's a lot of change. Uh, we see a lot of startups here driving change, driving disruption, driving innovation. Um, and I'm really looking forward to talking to many of you, talking to many of the startups. Thank you very much, and have a great conference. Thank you very much.